Jesus is speaking in this text and he's talking to all of his, those who would be followers of, of him. Here's what he says. You are the salt of the earth. But what good is salt if it has lost its flavor? Can you make it salty again? It will be thrown out and trampled underfoot as worthless. You, you are the light of the world. Like a city sit on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. And no one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, they place it on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. Shout amen. amen. Please be seated. God, we're asking you to do something supernatural today as we share and minister. May we all leave here changed and brighter lights for you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, here we are. Uh, we are literally just a few hours away from the second presidential debate that uh, the entire country, I think, is waiting with tiptoe expectancy to see what is going to happen. What's remarkable about this political season is that we are uh, given two options from the major parties that are the most, both of them, the most unpopular options in the history of America elections, at least since we've been recording. Now, that's notwithstanding that I'm sure that across this congregation and those watching by video, there are many who actually are passionately committed to their uh, various candidates. However, I'm reminded that a few weeks, I think it was last week, I watched the vice presidential debate, and afterwards uh, they had a focus group made up of uh, undecided, and they asked a range of questions to these undecided people, and then at the end, the very last question was, by show of hands, how many of you would prefer that the folk running for vice president would in fact be running for president? And almost 100% of the hands went up. And uh, that, was, uh, that was telling to me, essentially, I think, communicated what lots of us feel, which is, really wish we could start over. Can we start over? <laughs> so, so, nevertheless... These are the choices that we have, and as a, result of it, as a result of that, we have a lot of different feelings. There are those of us who have feelings of frustration and anger and disappointment and actually just literally fear about the future and about the future of our children. So it's a reasonable question for us to ask today, what should be the disposition of a follower of Jesus in this election season? How should we act? How should we engage? How should we engage in discourse or participate? And Jesus really answers this question here uh, and the, what is called the Sermon on the Mount when he says essentially to all who his followers in every aspect of our lives, including our political world, he is saying to us, you should be salt and light. Everybody say salt and light. Essentially what Jesus is saying is that regardless to what party you're in or what political persuasion you have, that there should be something unique about your participation, something unique about how you engage in political discourse that actually calls people to pause, that actually calls people to take a second look, that actually kind of makes you stand out because you're so radically different than the folk around you by how you participate. So, like, well, where does this come from? How, how do I, help me with that. Well, if Matthew was here, he would say, uh, this radical difference begins with responding with a radical commitment to Jesus as king. Everybody say king. In its historic context, as well as in ours, king means absolute authority. Now, Matthew, uh, most of us, when we read the Bible, we totally miss the politics in the Bible. I'm here to tell you, the Bible's full of politics. And, and as a matter of fact, everybody say kingdom. kingdom. 
whenever you come across that word in the Bible, uh, in, in, in the Bible kingdom, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, that's a highly political term in its original context because, because the kingdom of that day was the Roman Empire. And in order to pledge your allegiance to the king of the Roman Empire, you, you would often ask to respond like this. Uh, Caesar is Lord. And so Matthew is saying something extraordinarily political when he writes to those uh, in his Jewish community that when you think about Jesus, he is saying you should declare that Jesus is king of the Jews. That Jesus is Lord. Now he does this with the whole book. I'm just going to give you a few examples. In chapter 1, uh, he begins in chapter 1, verse 1, with what I call the royal genealogy of the king. He says, Jesus is the Messiah who is the son of David. That's the, that's the pinnacle of royalty for the children of Israel, for the nation of Israel. And all, who is also the son of Abraham, which means that Jesus is also the product of the promise. Then in chapter 2, verse 2, it is Matthew that reminds his readers that the wise men came from the east asking the question, where is he born the king of the Jews? And then when we get to chapter 5 through 7, uh, really it is the king laying out his, his demands for his, those who would be his followers. He's saying, if you're going to follow me, here's the radical life that I'm that, that you need to, to live the values you need to express. And we're going to dig more into this over the course of the next several weeks in radical living. And if you just work through Matthew, you'll see him constantly driving home the point. No, now Jesus is the king of the Jews, not Caesar. Jesus, not the Roman Empire, but God's kingdom is the dominant power emerging in the world. That's he's driving that point home. When you get to chapter 27... Verse 37, you'll find something interesting. Jesus, the king, is dying on the cross. And over his head, Matthew would remind people that over his head is written these words. Jesus, the king of the Jews. That was his charge, right? Which reminds us that he was actually put to death for a political reason. But it is also a reminder from Matthew's perspective that the one who died and rose again is the king of the Jews. And everybody had to acknowledge it. Now let's just stop right here. Let me just ask you a really basic, practical question about the political candidates we will be watching tonight. Which one of them will die for you? That's helpful to keep in mind because Jesus, the, the king, the one who Revelation will ultimately say is king of kings and lords of lords, he died for you. He died for me. He died for us. He died for them. Come on now. And then on the third day, it is Matthew who will remind us in chapter 28, verse 18, that he got up with all, he got up and conquered death, and he returned to his disciples, and he said to his disciples, uh, 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 all authority. Come on, say all authority. All authority, not 25% of the authority, not 30% of the authority, not, not temporary authority, but all authority in heaven and all authority on earth has been given to me. The word authority means he gets to have the last word. Therefore, what Matthew was saying to those who were listening to him as he write, he was saying, if you declare, declare Jesus as king because his kingdom is going to last longer than the Roman Empire. He's on the throne, and that is going to be a, a, a longer reality than Caesar. Well, let's check it. Is the Roman Empire around? Is Caesar around? Uh, and what happened to Caesar's successor? Well, here is the good news. Jesus is on the throne. He was on the throne, is on the throne before the election of 2016. He'll be on the throne while the election of 2016 is taking place. He'll be on the throne after the election of 2016. Come on now, listen. Whoever becomes president, they have four years, maybe eight years, but Jesus is in charge for eternity. Lord of lords and kings of kings. And that's where my hope is. So this election challenges you with a basic question. Where is your ultimate trust? 
If your ultimate trust is in Jesus, King of kings and Lords of lords, then you're in a pretty good spot. Because here's what Jesus teaches us throughout history. Whoever is president or king, because he's king of kings and lord of lords, he says, and that because he'll have the last word, he drives his redemptive story no matter who's in the White House. He uses the broken, even the brokenness of America to achieve his purposes. He's on the throne. That's where my trust. Now, tell somebody, uh, tell the person next to you, this is good therapy. Tell them. It's good therapy. It's good therapy. We need a little therapy right here before we, we got it. We need a little therapy, right? For free. That's right. For free. <laughs> Here's why this, and it's practical. Here's why. Because if we have rested our hope, the total hope of our future, if it rests on Mr. Trump or Mrs. Clinton, if that's where your future rests, I understand why you want to fight people. <laughs> I understand why you defriending folk off your Facebook. Right? If that's, if that's where your future rests, come on, that raises your blood pressure. Come on, that, that, that makes you, yeah, that puts you in line for a good heart attack because, 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 you know, they just flawed. By the way, every U.S. president has been flawed. By the way, every U.S. president after them will be flawed. I thank God for Jesus. All right, um, let me get back. Therapy. Here's the therapy. If the, if the, if the bulk of my trust is in Jesus, that, that doesn't mean I, that means I, I'm going to vote and I'm going to do my best. But it's like when I was a kid, I used to have, uh, I, I used to buy, we buy these Cokes. I walked down from my grandma and I buy these Cokes and uh, the old fashioned Coke and the, bottle you did you know, pop the bottle but when I was coming back I'd be running and playing and I forget that the coke is shaking up <laughs> and so I get ready to pop that thing up <laughs> so I after after a while I kind of learned right that you get the coke it's shook up here's the therapy piece you got it you got it you got it you got it you got to ease that top which allows the pressure to escape. When you realize that Jesus is the ultimate one responsible for your future, it allows the pressure of the, of the present moment to ease. Amen. It, it, while it's important who's president, that matters, but that's not what matters most. And it allows the pressure I told you it's good therapy, didn't I? Now, if you don't believe that Jesus is Lord, if you don't believe that he has the first word and the last word over human history and over America and over your future, then I'm praying for you. Because you really are in trouble. But because I know who Jesus is, Whatever happens on election day, he gets to have the last word. All right, that helps, that helps me out, right? That gives me a mental position, mental disposition, so that I can now prepare myself to participate with the right frame of mind. And so as I think about participating with the right frame of mind, then Matthew would say, number one, you need to respond with a radical commitment to Jesus as king. And number two, you need to think deeply about what his values are. Everybody say his values. His values. Now, I know in election context, we're taught to think about what your values are. That's right. That's appropriate. But if you are a follower of Jesus, and by the way, if you're not a follower of Jesus and you're thinking, well, you know, it's the Christians that's really gotten us in this trouble anyway, uh, I'm just going to tell you, just, just listen a little while, but you just walk along with me because I will agree that some Christians, how might I say this? Oh, I said this to Pastor Tilden earlier today. I said, I said, I said, 
the world would be different if Christians acted like Christians. Then I had a revelation. I said, oh no, let me correct that. The world would be different if Christians acted like Jesus. So Jesus now in this text, he appears as a, as a king. He's in chapter 5. He says, all right, all right, you need to think deeply about his values. And, 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 and this, this beatitude is reflected again in chapter 25 of Matthew. You should read it when you get home. It's quite radical. And, 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 and verse 1 begins by simply saying that Jesus looks around and sees a crowd gathering. So he goes up to the, uh, to the mountainside and he sits down in, in the context of a rabbi that is about to teach. And his disciples gathers around him and he begins to teach them. And he's also is, is reminding folk kind of of Moses going to the mountain and, and bringing back the law. Because what he's about to do with this value system he's about to unroll is radically interpret uh, the, the Jewish community understanding of the law. He's about to help them to understand here's what God values. And he's going to argue this. God blesses what God values. Come on, say it. God blesses what God values. All right, these are the values of the kingdom. And, and, and this is what we ought to study. So Jesus begins. He's looking out in the crowd. He's, such, he's filled with the spirit of God. He's so charismatic. As he speaks, people are just locked in on him uh, just to see. They're so excited about what he's saying. And he's looking out there. He sees rich people. He sees poor people. He sees grieving people. He sees excited people. Come on, he sees people at the height of their power. He sees people uh, under the iron feet of oppression. He's looking at them all. They're all together. And he starts to, he looks around at them. And then he says, he's talking about values. God blesses what God values. He says, God blesses those who are poor and recognizes their need for him. He says, the kingdom of heaven is theirs. And folk are shocked. And he looks around, he sees some people grieving. He says, God blesses those who mourn, for you shall be comforted. And he looks around, and he sees some people at the bottom of life. And he says to them, and God blesses those who are humble. For they will inherit the whole earth. And then he looks around and he sees some people who's on the wrong side of justice. And, 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 and I like, actually like the, the, he says, God blesses those who hunger and thirst for justice. Now the better word is righteousness. Everybody say righteousness. Because righteousness is like two sides of the same corn. It's just two meanings. One side of the corn is, of righteousness is God blesses those who hunger and thirst to live better. To be better. To be more of what God has called them to be. That's one. And then the flip side of the corn is God blesses those who hunger and thirst to be treated better. To be on the right side of justice. People are looking around. They're grieving. They think God has forgotten about them. They're on the wrong side of justice. They think God has forgotten about them. They've been trying to do better, but they keep messing up. And they think God has forgotten about them. And he says, no, 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 no. And then he looks around at some folk who I'm sure are kind of like our Democrat and Republican friends who, who don't want to have mercy for people in the other party. He says, God blesses those who are givers of mercy, for they shall receive mercy. And then he looks around and he says, and God blesses those of you who have pure hearts. And, and you know, you got to think, man, there's not, there's not many rabbis out there. There's not many synagogue attenders out there. These are fishermen and rebellious folk and all this. But he's looking and he said, but God blesses those who have pure hearts because they will see God. Here's his point. If your heart is right, You'll see God in places that other folk won't see God. If your heart is right, you'll see God in people that other people will write off. If your heart is right, God blesses. And he looks around, he looks around, he looks around, he looks around, and he says, and, and God blesses. He sees some people working to bridge the gap, and, and they feel like they've, 
They're fighting all by themselves to make things, to bring the viciousness together. And he, he sees them and he says, And God blesses those who work for peace. For they shall be called, not Republicans, <laughs> not Democrats, not Libertarians. Come on, not, not the Green Partiers, but they shall be called children of God. Oh my. And then he says, watch this, because he keeps it abstract, but then he, he's about to get personal in a minute. And then he says, and God blesses those who are persecuted. Watch it. For doing the right thing. What do you mean? Why would you say that last one? I don't like that one. He's saying. If you begin to stand up in your family. Stand up in whatever political party you're. Because you are a follower of mine. If, if you understand that, that my values is, 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 not, is, is always kind of other people centered. If 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 if, 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 if see, it's not it's not necessarily who you vote for, but it's why you're voting for. And if 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 if, if your debate is all about you and what you gonna get and how you gonna be elevated or uh, uh, demoted, Jesus said you're missing the point. He said because my high value is other people focused. So 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 you, in, in your debate circles, if you gonna speak up, speak up for the poor. Speak up for those who realize they need God. Make sure that your party, your family, your community never forget that they need God. Come on. That's my value. He said, if you're going to engage, engage for those who are grieving and moaning. Come on. If, you, if, if, if you're going to fight, well, come on now. Fight from the low position of humility. Recognizing that just because you think you're right doesn't mean you're right. Everybody say humility. Come on. If you're going to speak up, speak up for those who's on the wrong side of justice and keep challenging people in your circles to be better than who they are. Come on, if you're going to work, challenge those around you with the question, are we offering mercy? Are we working for peace? And he says, now if you start speaking up like that in your circles, in your families, on your job, he said, now you're going to be persecuted, but don't worry about it. God blesses those who are persecuted for doing right. That's what he says. All right, now here's some little insight that I'm making. Somebody asked, well, is Jesus Republican or Democrat? And the answer is both. Somebody say, can't be. I, I, I've, I've had Republican friends, I'm telling you the truth, I've had Republican friends who say, I, I don't understand how you can be Democrat and say. All right? And I've had Democrat friends who say, I don't understand how you can be Republican and be saved. Man, y'all are missing the point. Come on now. Because what Jesus is saying, I got people in the Republican Party. I got people in the Democratic Party. I got people in the Green Party. I got people, come on, in, in every party. Why? Just look around you. We, we represent all of that. He said, but, but my people are bound together by my values. Come on now. And if they drive my values where they are, they are the salt of the earth. Amen. What's meant by salt of the earth? He's not talking about your table salt. Back in the Palestinian time, they had multiple different kinds of salt. And they had a certain salt that they would use that they would work into the ground so that it would soak in close to the roots so that if the plant, because of environmental reasons or because of insects, started to die up top of the ground, because the salt was preserving the roots, y'all ain't listening, <laughs> that even though it dies up top, the root is preserved. 
and what dies can come back to life. Y'all ain't listening. So the word radical is actually a Latin word that means root. Are y'all listening to me? And so when he says, thou, you are the salt of the earth. You are the salt of the soil. That's what it's really, the literal translation. What he's saying is, whatever party you're in, you ought to, you ought to be preserving the roots of my values. Y'all ain't listening. Good God. My values, not your party value. My value. That's why you're there. Speak up for my values. I, I remember when I was in Boston, and um, we had a couple of blizzards. You know, I, I, I loved my 17 and a half years in Boston, but I don't miss that cold. <laughs> I don't the snow. Man, this one blizzard, this is true. Snow was up to the top of the stop sign. And what I thought was remarkable when we finally were able to come out, I watched folk who never talked to each other start shoveling snow together. I watched folk go down the street, help their neighbors. I watched people get out of their cars and help other folk who they didn't know. They didn't ask, are you Republican or you Democrat? They didn't ask, were you Jewish, were you Christian? But they, they, they just got out and just started helping. Now, what happened was when the snow melted, they kind of went back to life as usual. All right, I remember the same thing with 9-11. Do you all remember this country in 9-11 when we, we were attacked, the Twin Towers had been attacked? Do you remember Republicans and Democrats standing out on the congressional steps declaring, God bless America? Do you remember? I, I, I stood with Muslim uh, clerics and Jewish rabbis on a stage, and we both raised the standard for justice together. I, 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 I remember folk forgetting their distinctions because there was a greater connection. Y'all, we realized we were Americans. Y'all remember that? And, and America's, uh, y'all, American support. When I, what, this is the point I'm This is what Jesus is saying. He, he is saying, when you are his follower, it doesn't matter what party you're in. There is a kingdom unity driven by a kingdom set of values and it causes you to see each other as the children of God even across the aisles. That's radical politics. That's for Jesus followers. Jesus followers. All right. Here's the third thing. So Matthew was here. He would say, number one, You've got to respond with a radical commitment to Jesus as king. Number two, you've got to think deeply about what is Jesus' values and make sure that wherever you are, you're preserving the roots. Number three, you should pray for the heart of Jesus. You should pray for the heart. Of Jesus. Here, yeah, this Sermon on the Mount is pretty radical from chapter 5 to chapter 7. You go to chapter 7, verse 12, you hear Jesus saying something like this. Listen, he said, hey, Do unto others in the other party, do unto others across racial lines, do unto others, folk who you adamantly disagree with, do unto others, not what you're going to see on the debate tonight, do unto others. As you would have them to do unto you. Now that's radical. Because the principle that the world follows is do unto others as they do unto you. My heart. Because you see, Jesus said, I died for all you boogers. I died for all of you. I shed my blood for all of you. I, I bled for all of you. For all of you. I, I went in the grave for all of you. I, I, I was crucified for all of you. All right. Here's the principle. Therefore, if I'm practicing what he's teaching me in my political discourse, 
I'm practicing this. I'm going to refuse to vilify the other candidate and folk in the other party. Why? Because I'm going to do unto them as I want them to do unto me. Number two, uh, I'm going to refuse. Everybody say refuse. I'm going to refuse to attack a name call or label as less Christian folk who are in the other party. Why? Because I'm going to do unto others as I'd have them do unto me. Now, this same Jesus in chapter 5, verse 36, I'm talking about this radical teaching he has. Here's what he said. You remember this. He says, if you're hit on one cheek, turn to what? Turn the other cheek. Now, I had a friend of mine, pretty funny guy. He said to me, he said, I'm trying to do what Jesus said. He said, so I'm going to tell you this right now. He said, you hit me. I have one cheek. I'm going to turn the other one. You hit me on that one. I'm going to say I'm out of cheeks now. <laughs> I gave him the best. But my friend, you missed the point. Because the same Jesus said, uh, if somebody takes you out of court, give them your inner court. Coat. Uh, the same Jesus said, if they force you to go one mile, go, go five miles. Well, what is he talking about? Well, conceptually, here's what he's saying. He's saying you've got to break the cycle of violence. Violence beget violence. So in our political discourse, he's saying you've got to break the cycle of violence. So stop name calling. Stop attacking. Stop labeling other people. Say, with me, it stops. Why? Because I'm praying for the heart of Jesus. And those people I'm labeling, Jesus died for. I'm praying for his heart. You know, I had a fellow, a few weeks ago, a prominent guy, Christian leader, came out in support of one of the political candidates. He said he was shocked at the, the hatred he received from other Christians. He said, people wrote him and said, I can't believe you could support that particular candidate. You are no longer my friend. And all kinds of horrible things. He shared this with tears in his eyes. It's coming from church folk. It's coming from so-called Jesus followers. I, I, I think I'm kind of making the distinction between Christians and Jesus followers. Some folk who wear the title but don't understand what it means to follow Jesus. And so what he said was, he sent them notes back, and he said to them, uh, the people asked, well, what did you respond? He said, I just told them I love them. And he said, I'll be there for you if you want to come back. My heart's open. And then with tears in his eyes, he said, you know, everybody's arguing about truth. He said, but truth is not a fruit of the Spirit. Love is. What he meant was two things. He meant... What Paul said, the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 13 said this, we know in part, we prophesy in part, we preach in part, in part, everybody say in part. In other words, we think we know the whole thing, but we just know half of it. Only when that which is perfect has come, will we know as we are known. You need to be humble about your understanding of the truth. However, you can be audacious about your capacity to love even beyond disagreement. Because if God lives in you, he should equip you to love folk you disagree with. Amen. Oh, that's radical. That's right. That makes you a standout in your family. That makes you a standout in the bar that you attend. That makes you a standout. Go in there and talking like that. This is what Jesus meant when he says, he makes it personal back to the passage. He makes it personal when he says, then he says, he said, blessed are those, blessed are those. But then he gets to the verse where he says, blessed are you. When people mock you, make fun of you and persecute you. Well, why would they be doing that? Because I'm acting like what I just told you. When people lie on you, misjudging your motives, why would they be doing that? Because you, you, you standing up for values, for God values. When, when, people, when people say all manner of evil things against you, he said, it, because you are my followers. Because you're standing up for my values. He said, don't worry about it. 
Great is your reward. That's radical politics. Here's the last one. And I'll be finished because I've lost sight of time. Uh, what time is it? Uh, here's my last one. Pray for the heart of God, which means I'm not going to vilify. I'm not going to attack. Watch this. And I'm not going to rejoice in other people's pain. Now, I was watching what was happening to Mr. Trump this weekend. He had a tough weekend. And his weekend was so tough that what happened to Miss Hillary kind of got under the wire. But both of them had bad stories. Miss Hillary, the story came out that she was at the Wall Street uh, meeting with the big folk at Wall Street, and she said, I got one set of policies publicly, and I got another set privately. But the, 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 their camp was excited and happy because you didn't get to read that because Mr. Trump, what he said was so audacious and horrendous. Took up. Now, here's what I noticed. Folk, not all. Come on, say not all. No. But a lot <laughs> of folk who were Democrats was glued to the TV with popcorn. <laughs> having a ball. Say, 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 stop that. Let's get all the neighbors over, all the folk. I'm, I'm going to show that clip of, of what Mr. Trump said again. Hear what these news people say. Oh, man, the Republican Party is falling apart. Oh, this is great news. They're in disarray. You're thinking, oh, this is wonderful. Is there any way that he can, no way he can win? He, he might even just, who knows what he's going to do. he just jump off the cliff or something. I don't know. <laughs> do you think that's what Jesus was feeling? Do you know if the Republican Party, the, what they've been through the last 48 hours, do you know that reflects millions of people who are in heart-wrenching pain? What about Mrs. Trump? What about his daughters? What about his campaign folk who've invested their life assuming, uh, of fighting for values that they actually believe in to see everything turned upside down? What about the exposure? What about the shame? And you gleeful? Everybody say repent. You said, pray for the heart of Jesus. And I promise you, Jesus was not gleeful over this weekend. There are, Democ there are Republicans who can't wait to the night because they've already sent in their emails to Mr. Trump. Say, Mr. Trump, if you're going to survive, here's what you got to do. You got to pull out all of Mr. Clinton's dirty underwear. Go into the closet, pull it all out, put it right on top of the table. Let's put out everything he's ever done so you can embarrass his wife and, 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 and we're going to be sitting there because, because we want you to win so you just mess her up. Do you think that's how Jesus feels? I'm talking to Jesus followers. If you're not Jesus followers, you can kind of just do what you want to do, but I'm talking to Jesus followers. Do you understand the pain it must have been for her to have to deal with these stories of her husband cheating on her and it's coming back? What about his daughter, Chelsea? How that must deal? What about family members and relatives who are being devastated all over again? But is the only thing that matters to you is who wins? Now, let me just say to you, I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to us. I'm included. I've been a political junkie all my life. I've got some clear political uh, uh, instincts and convictions and all of that. And don't you dare ask me what they are because I'm not telling you. <laughs> but I got them, right? And I have found myself over the last several weeks in one of these different kinds of camps. But I, I, I heard Jesus kind of whisper in my, my spirit, are you feeling about this the way I'm feeling?
pray for the heart of God. That changes how you look at the debates. It changes your whole calculation. Finally, at the very end, Jesus said this. If you can start acting like I'm teaching, pursuing my values, preserving the roots in the soil of my values, then you're going to be a light. You're going to be like a city sitting up on a big old hill in the darkest of night, is what he's saying. And you, 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 you're going to be just like, you'll be, you'll be my... You know, they won't be able to miss your behavior, your discourse. And, and, and I read somewhere in some political document, we the people... In order to make it more perfect, you did not say we the president. It did not say we the Senate. As a matter of fact, when it was written, it only referred to white men who own property. But the concept was universal and really God-given. And, 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 and Christians do well in democracies. So why, what are you talking about? Okay, let's go back to the passage. When Jesus says, you're the salt, you're the light, who is he talking to? He's talking to the same people who he, who he referred to earlier as the poor. And the mourning, and the folk who's on the wrong side of justice, and the folk who need, and they say, Well, wait a minute, why are you talking to us? We like need to be rescued and helped. And Jesus says, If I'm the king, I've already empowered you, you're gonna become a part of the solution. Story. The guy, I'll just call his first name Kevin, his true story. Lives in Atlanta, Georgia, basketball star. Married his high school sweetheart. Three years in their marriage, they had their first daughter. Eight months old, the daughter dies of a rare disease. Tears up their marriage. They split up. A year later, they come back together. They have a second child who does pretty good. They have a third child who is ultimately diagnosed with the same disease as the first child. Miraculously, the child is preserved, but is physically disabled. So as a child aged out of high school, the father found him just staying at home. There was nothing for him to do. There was no place for him to go. The father was meeting with his prayer group on a day, on a weekly basis, and he started asking the guys, he said, will y'all pray with me? We need a solution about my son who's just at home playing games, whatever, but wasting away. They didn't call the president of the United States. They didn't even call a senator to solve it. We the people. In our prayer group, they start talking to Jesus, who's the king. Jesus sparked an imagination in them. And they realized they had about five other young men in the church just like that. And so one guy says, I got access to a gym. And another guy said, well, I used to run a recreational program. So they all got together and took the five to the gym. And so every day they created a structure where they do a little Bible study and reflection. And then they started playing basketball in their wheelchairs. And then they got engaged in some other community stuff growing out of that. And today they've got more than 50 disabled folk in wheelchairs participating daily in that program. Here's one man, didn't ask the president, didn't ask the vice president, didn't ask the senator. I'm trying to tell you, it matters who's president, but it doesn't matter that much. Because at the end of the day, America will be judged not by its presidents, but by its people. Amen. By you. Me. We the people. He changed that one fella in touch with the king. Changed his family. Changed his church. Changed his community. How radical would it be for this country if Christians would dare to act like Jesus? Amen. Amen. Here's your connection card. Somebody today, everybody ought to take a next step. You ought to think about a next step. If you look at the card, one next step is to say, I want to join Jesus' team. I want him to be king. You ought to just check it. Somebody else may say, you know, it's time for me to be baptized. Or you know what, it's time for me to join a small group. We've got a new pastor, small group, ready to start a new season. I want to be a part of that. 
But under the response to the message, turn over, I want you to look under the response to the message because here's the big challenge. Here's the big challenge. Here's what I want to challenge you with. If you've listened to me and if you actually believe 90% of what I said, then I want you to make the commitment that you will represent, in this election season, you will represent Jesus as best as you can. You won't be flawless. You won't be perfect. But now you've got a sense of his values. You're going to pray for his heart. And you're going to ask him to use you to reserve the roots and shine a light. If that's you, if you're ready to make that commitment, I want you to write it down and turn it in. And here's what, here's what I want you to write. I will represent not my party, not my parents, the King, Jesus. Amen.